The main section of this book is comprised of poems about John Wilkes Booth and about the people um, whose life he had tragic impact on beyond the obvious national scene in the Lincolns. And this particular poem is a, a quick introduction to the series. We're handed Booth um, in high school as something of a, a stock villain, almost a melodrama villain. Uh, but in fact, he was quite the matinee star in his time. This poem will quote um, one of his fellow actors. It will quote uh, one of the reviewers um, <coughs> who saw his plays. And, uh, and also we'll have a little quotation from Booth who, who justified in part his killing of Lincoln by the fact that he felt Lincoln had become too regal and he called him King Lincoln. It's called Booth, A Quick History. As animals in a pack hasten after their sovereign, wrote one co-star, so we followed him. He was, after all, a Beau Brummel, but robust in the eyes of one reviewer. The ninth child, the favorite, he chose his father's profession, and with his swashbuckling style became America's matinee idol. A quick wit, an adroit horseman, he insisted on stage swordplay so violent he was often wounded and bore many scars, though not all critics were impressed with his elocution. Nonetheless, when he stepped out limping as Richard or black-faced for the moor, his anthracite eyes in the limelight flashed like mesmers, and ladies in the front row swooned. He held his liquor well and guaranteed good box office from St. Louis to Boston, but while he flourished during the war, his views on slavery grew more fiery, and he was not one to hold his tongue about how King Lincoln was a tyrant. History casts him as misfit, but he rode a crest of success until Gettysburg, a prosperous celebrity, though his love of the Confederacy led him to anger and brandy. After Lee's surrender, he saw everything as theater and tragedy. He never understood why even the Southern press turned on him after his brash act. Even that last morning, he deemed himself a wounded angel in the blazing barn. Brutus was his model, and on his deathbed, he begged his mother, be spared the details. He was 26. After a hasty autopsy, he was buried under a dungeon. But for decades, acquaintances claimed to meet him in Hong Kong, Paris, or the brothels of New Orleans. While an effigy alleged to be his mummy toured the country in sideshows billed as remains of the villainous assassin. Bad luck, ruin or fire followed every owner of that grisly display. But the crowds came, rain or shine. They stood in line for hours and whispered, appalled, as they waited to pay. I frequently write about um, old-time and bluegrass musicians, and <clears throat> I've written two or three poems about the, the Carter family. This one is um, the source of the title of the book, Outlaw Style, and it's about um, the particular method of playing that one of the Carter family came up with, uh, playing the guitar. It mentions two Carter family um, songs, the storms are on the oceans and bury me beneath the weeping willow. The Carter Scratch. What solitude and simmer gave birth to this sweet mix? One country woman strumming a duet, melody running the bass, but the high strings thumb brushed for backup rhythm. It's a mystery how her touch contrived what's called the Carter Scratch. Maybe it was mischief in her black guitar. Maybe the Clinch Mountains are to blame. Her fingers were deft, but leathered from scraping in the hard scrabble earth to snatch chokeweeds from the bean vines, and strong as claws from plucking hens or shucking the stubborn corn. She'd heard the river cord fast over rapids and smooth at the soothing ford. So Maybell rocked in the dark parlor to raise the cadence. The storms are on the ocean. Bury me beneath the weeping willow. Stitch by stitch. 
she improvised an outlaw style. And after the Bristol sessions, the whisper talk in Met Nashville was, these ridgers can really pick. She'd played like sisters and kept her Gibson warm in the kitchen. One hand's nails were sharp as talons. To keep her spirit busy, she'd sing and hum and whistle hymns of the heart, skimp and yearn of the stricken flesh. She'd fret and frail the strings to bliss while coffee boiled and corn cakes frizzled. Maybelle called herself a Nicholsville hick and often played at being rapt and simple to keep the curious at a distance as her nimble hands gave country music its intricate quintessential lick.